Okay, we are live. Welcome everyone to The Annex, a podcast about academic sociology. My name is Joseph Cohen. I'm a professor of sociology at Queens College in the City University of New York. And our podcast is on the web, theannexpodcast.com. The Annex is a production of the Queens Podcast Lab. For more, visit queenspodcastlab.org. And with that, we are ready to begin, and we have one heck of a panel today. We are talking about the intersection of the sociology of race and the sociology of culture, and we got a who's who panel of who's working at that intersection today in 2022. And I'm going to start off with our first guest, from the University of Laverne, Raul Perez, author of The Souls of White Jokes, How Racist Humor Fuels White Supremacy with Stanford University Press. It's a book about racist humor and the question of whether racist jokes are something that we should be laughing off or something that we should be treating as a serious thing with negative real world, uh, with real world problems with a title like that and a super timely discussion raul it is great to meet you welcome to the annex uh thanks for having me joe thanks for reaching out and uh i really appreciate ann and victor being here um and i'm really excited for the discussion we'll be having today so thanks again next from the university of iowa he recently published on critical race theory why it matters and why you should care with random house random house i saw and and this morning i saw it's uh amazon editors pick for best nonfiction. this is victor ray from the university of best nonfiction with your book from random house victor congratulations welcome thank you and uh thanks for having me and when I knew, and when I had the opportunity to discuss Raul's book, this was uh, something I didn't want to miss or pass up. So, oh, that's awesome! Yeah, it's getting all sorts of of energy, Raul. And then third, I am very thrilled to welcome, in my opinion, one of our generation's best sociologists of culture. And morning from New York University, and is coming out with a new book soon too. An Ugly Word, Rethinking Race in Italy and the United States with Russell Sage. Her book is part of this amazing subfield on comparative race, how conceptions of race differ across countries and cultures, and what that tells us about the cultural construction of race. Uh, we're, we'll talk about it a little bit today, but I want to reserve some because I'm hoping to rope her back into coming in the, in the spring. Welcome and morning from NYU. Thank you so much, Joe. It is just fantastic to be here with, as you put it, this all-star panel, and I am really looking forward to, to celebrating Raul's fantastic new book. Before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit, because Victor is here, and Victor I've been following for a long time on Twitter, and I've just been waiting to have uh, this discussion with uh, some uh, Twitter, uh, other so Twitter sociologists. Uh, as many of you know, uh, it, social Twitter or Twitter itself was taken over by uh, the billionaire Elon Musk and a lot of sociologists re reacted quite negatively to it, either swearing off Twitter or, you know, investing their attention uh, elsewhere. And uh, I've been looking at the web properties that I mentioned, the sociology theme web properties and traffic on everything is down like 60, 80%. And I take this as a sign that sociology Twitter is dying. And I don't know how to feel about it. You know, it was something that I guess there's like some schadenfreude going on with some people happy to see, you know, the whole thing go down in flames. But in the process, I can't help but think that we're both losing an asset and we're getting rid of something that might have not been good for us. Victor, what's your take on the possible death of sociology Twitter? So uh, I... I think what you, what you just sort of concluded your introduction to this section is 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 true. Like it, I think we are both losing an asset and perhaps something that is not like entirely good for us. Um, I think Twitter, from a very sort of like personal career level, Twitter has undoubtedly been good for me. So you know, I 
made a joke on Twitter uh, during the sort of like height of the critical race theory moral panic that I was going to capitalize on the moment and write a pop book on critical race theory. And like a couple of editors and agents reached out to me and that's how I ended up like writing the book for Random House, right? Uh, yep. And so it was like direct like tweet to, to book pipeline. And so I that happened. I've written for you know the Washington Post and Harvard Business Review, literally based off of tweets that editors saw, uh, yeah. either tweets that I myself had written or tweets that colleagues had tagged me into. So you know, there, there's that aspect of it. The other aspect of it is I think, you know, one of our most famous papers in sociology, and probably the most cited paper in sociology, is the strength of weak ties. Mm. And Twitter is weak ties, right? Like Twitter is a, is, is a broad social network that allows us to both like meet colleagues and, you know, it levels, it does not eliminate hierarchies, right? Yeah. But it levels some of the hierarchies that are sort of built into uh, the discipline. Right yeah. through universities, and um, you know, I think I'm probably on this podcast in part because of like my presence on Twitter, and so I think there have been real uh, career benefits. Uh, that being said, you know, it's addictive. Um, yeah. It is uh, a cesspool sometimes, full of like invective. I've been like harassed and targeted for some unpleasant things because of Twitter. Um, and, you know, being on there in the few weeks since the Musk takeover has been like, like, like much more unpleasant than normal, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I've seen like Rayshawn Ray and a couple of other folks have, have written about sort of the, the huge rise in uh, hate speech, right? And, yeah. and racism, anti-Semitism that happened. Um, and so, you know, I have mixed feelings about continuing to be there. Right now I'm at a sort of wait and see. Um, but yeah, I think, I definitely think we we are losing something, right? Yeah. And some of what we're losing, it might be good to lose, but. Raul, you said you, we were talking earlier in the pre-show, you said that you just joined Twitter, just joined the party and it's already uh, dying off. What's your feeling about the potential death of Twitter? Yeah, I mean, I, I I honestly had a lot of reservations about Twitter um, uh, when I was a grad student is when I feel like uh, kind of my generation in a sense of, of sociologists coming into their own, I mean, folks like Victor really captured that, that they were able sort of to capture what Twitter had to offer. Um, and as, as Victor puts it really well, the strength of weak ties. You can meet people you wouldn't ordinarily meet at a conference, you can meet people uh, outside of your discipline, you can meet people outside of your profession. Um, and if, you know, if, if people find your work interesting or timely or whatever, opportunities open up. I mean, um, so, so, so that side of Twitter um, is something that I more recently have kind of discovered. But my hesitation for Twitter was a result of seeing people lose, um, you know, positions, uh, you know, not just, uh, uh, you know, tenure track jobs, but people with tenure were losing jobs for a tweet that they mentioned or they said, and a board of directors somewhere or a university president, you know, gets an email, and all of a sudden this academic is sort of, you know, in in the crosshairs to be uh, removed from from their position. So I always kind of saw Twitter as this kind of potential for, on the one hand, enhancing somebody's ability to reach, you know, people beyond their sort of networks and circles, but also depending on the content and con. Uh, uh, and the, and the social and political context that your comments are sort of being circulated, I also saw it as a way that could sort of backfire and really ruin somebody's life, you know? Yeah. Um, and so this was happening uh, while I was a, a graduate student. Um, and so it's really interesting what Twitter offers, uh, as Victor says, the strength of weak ties, meeting people beyond your sort of your, 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 your circles, creates opportunities. Um, and it was, I think, always premised on this idea of freedom of speech. Um, and, and this is something that Musk comes in and says, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that even better. I'm gonna sort of, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make all the, the, these sort of regulations on who can be on here and say what, I'm gonna make it better. Uh, and I think uh, if I remember correctly, one of his initial things was, you know, he's gonna make humor and comedy like legal on Twitter, yeah. something like that, right? Yeah. Um, and then right after, you know, he kind of takes over, he becomes the punching bag himself. Like he's sort of the, now the target of humor constantly. 
to the point where he now he's regulating accounts and he's saying you know he's suspending accounts that he finds you know troubling I guess he doesn't find them funny you know he's sort of forcing people to write the word parody on their account because you know uh, people were you know pretending to be him and making all kinds of ridiculous and hilarious comments um and so to see the inversion there right it's like for me it was a, a perfect sort of metaphor for you know someone who studies humor and, and tries to think about it historically in the present the way in which under feudalism, you know, the humor was allowed by the king and by the monarch under their sort of supervision. Like they are like the ultimate arbiters of this is funny, this is not, you know, and if I find what you're saying not funny, then I'm gonna punish you. And here is, here is Musk, the monarch for Twitter, you know, saying he's gonna expand freedom of speech and so forth, and as, as Victor points out, one of the first things we see rise and spike after he takes over is hate speech. Um, and then he starts to sort of discipline and punish and remove people because of you know, jokes um, and, and forms of humor he doesn't like or appreciate. So, so, so I think that, I mean, for me, the question that's interesting is not only that, you know, uh, are we sad that we're losing Twitter? For me, it's how and why are we losing Twitter? Like, mm. like what is happening? What, what, what is the context that humor, I'm sorry, that, that, that Twitter is being sort of uh, changed in a way that is impacting these sort of positive outcomes um, and possibilities that that Victor is is pointing to. Um, I mean, he's absolutely right. Like, I I would have not been invited to this podcast. I think without Twitter, my book would not have circulated without it. Sort of, you know, uh, being posted on Twitter, and then folks that see it interesting, you know, folks like Victor and others who say, hey, you know, this is something worthwhile. Check it out. So there is that leveling aspect uh, of it and you know, getting visibility that you wouldn't otherwise get. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so I think there is the potential to, to lose something because there isn't an equivalent outside of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, the, the link between the invitations and Twitter is just, it was the one place where you could get current information about what's going on in the discipline. People don't maintain blogs anymore. I mean, the ASA online stuff is not active. It does not. So if you wanted a steady stream of occupationally relevant information, that's where we're like, that's where what we're left with mostly. I don't know where else to get it. Uh, I'd love to. And I don't want to leave you out of this. I know that you're not a big Twitter fan, but like, <laughs> what's your just take on Twitter from the outside? What kept you from trying the drugs? <laughs> sure. So, uh, you know, a couple of things. First of all, um, I don't think I can add much more to, I think, the, you know, the very complete set of comments that, you know, that Victor and Raul gave. And, and I'm really coming from, I think, an older generation of folks who basically feel like they're being browbeaten by their universities to be on Twitter. Like, I feel, you know, like the university, like, has this seminar you have to go to, and they're, you know, pushing you to publicize your stuff at every, you know, possible occasion. So I'm kind of with one of those reluctant late adopters. Um I, you know, I guess my question is because I, I'm not on Twitter often, also just because I honestly, I mean, anyone who knows me knows that I barely managed to keep up with my email. I don't even do a good job at that. So the idea of also following stuff on Twitter just to me seems overwhelming, but I'm staying current. And I think, you know, Joseph, to your, your point about, um, you know, getting the latest in news, yeah, sure, kind of, but like how much news content is there compared to all of the like, the vitriol and the grandstanding and the puffery that it all comes embedded in. Like, I wonder, yeah. is, is it quite worth it? So I think I might be part of the contingent of people who, if, if people massively move off Twitter and I do the same, I don't think I'm going to resurface somewhere else like Mastodon or something else. That's yeah. my, you know, that's my guess. And I don't think I'll be the only one, but I, I thought also that Raul gave us a really great segue, you know, to his book in, in basically raising the ways in which um, humor gets used as this instrument of power and it's kind of a two-way two double-edged sword right it cuts both ways like humor great for the monarch you know the court yeah. jesters when it works in your favor not so good when you think it 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 turns on you um so i thought that was a really a, a really apt insight why don't we pivot to that and then maybe we'll talk a little bit more about humor later on because we were talking in pre-show about 
SCOTUS and the use of humor. But I feel like we should really set up Raoul's book because all of this has a humor angle and it's probably best for framing. The book is titled The Souls of White Jokes, How Racist Humor Fuels White Supremacy. It's published with the University of uh, or Stanford University Press. Right, Raoul? Sorry. Yes, I was. That's right. And so I thought maybe let's start off. Can you just give us a rundown? Start with the backstory. Like, how'd you get into this? And uh, like, what got you launched on studying racist humor? Oh man, how much time do we have? Huh. Uh, so, I mean, the, the the quick sort of backstory is, well, I was a you know, uh, graduate student. I have to pick a project and, and think of a topic to, to study. And, and of course, part of being a graduate student is you have to come up with some interesting, innovative, original project or whatever. Um, but I guess I, I've, I've long been interested in, in humor as this sort of social phenomenon that brings people together, but also creates boundaries and you know alienates people, uh, even before being an academic. Um, but I really started to take it more seriously, first as an undergraduate student, just really being interested in, um, in, in this problem of racist humor. Like, 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 how does it function? What does it do? Um, already with an interest in what humor does more broadly. Um, and it was when I was an undergraduate student at the University of California at Irvine, I was a transfer student, community college student. So in a sense, I felt like, okay, I need to kind of prove myself. Like I'm smart, just like everybody else who came from, from undergrad. Um, and I was living in the dorm rooms at, at, at Irvine and I was living in, the, in a themed house and we had themed housing. And one of those houses was the sociology house. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be living with sociology. Well, some of them were sociologists, some of them were not. But living in that context, I noticed very early on when, when we were all sort of making friends and, and making social connections and relations that um, you know, early on, uh, humor was a way to do that, to sort of to build friendships, alliances, and sort of you know, who, who you're gonna go to dinner with you know, after classes. Um, and pretty quickly, the trading of racial humor, racist jokes sort of, um, was kind of became part of like the normative sort of discourse inside of the, the dorms. And for me, it was really interesting because again, these weren't, these weren't jokes that I had not heard before. I mean, I heard these jokes in high school. I heard these jokes from family members, you know, from, from others. But for me, the contradiction was, wait a minute, I'm at the university, I'm living in the sociology themed house. You know, we're regularly getting emails from the university about diversity, equity, and inclusion and kind of stuff. And um, and so these things are happening. And I'm like, wait a minute, but then my dorm mates are sort of making these kind of jokes every day in this context. Um, and then, of course, there was the sort of geopolitical moment that was happening in this context. And for me, it was, you know, this was in the you know early 2000s. So it's right after the um, the the uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, and then it's also in the context of, you know, political cartoons being circulated that are uh, uh, very much, you know, uh, anti-Muslim. Uh, there was the, 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 the infamous case of the Danish, uh, you know, um, uh, ma magazine that published a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad with, you know, with a turban and there was a bomb on the head of the turban. Um, and of course, the context in which it was circulating was that, well, this is just a joke, it's satire. Um, and the fact that Muslim extremists don't find this funny just goes to show that um, they are incompatible with, you know, Western society and civilization. So the right. problem is them that can't take a joke, not us. And of course, this whole controversy makes its way to Irvine because Irvine at that point, and it still might have, the largest Muslim student population in the country. We had a, the Muslim Student Union was, was pretty pretty big on campus. And a lot of what, what the MSU did was to try to educate people about issues pertaining to uh, the Muslim Arab community, um, you know, and on the campus in Orange County, but also globally. And so, so this made it to, to UCI. And there was this big whole sort of debate because the campus Republican students were like, we got to show these cartoons. The Orange County Conservative Republican Party came and said, we got to show these cartoons. And of course, you can imagine the students are like, well, these cartoons are fucked up. Like, we don't want to show these cartoons. <laughs> yeah. It became a huge thing. And it was like, you know, hundreds of people protesting these, these sort of cartoons that are being shown. And, and this was sort of 
in a sense, weaponized as a way of, well, we got to learn the value of freedom of expression and free speech. Mm. And, you know, even these people over here who might not think it's funny, they need to understand why it's funny. And for me, it's like, wait a minute, um, these people are being bombed. And on top of that, uh, we're saying that we need to also sort of circulate, you know, jokes that they're seeing as, you know, adding insult to injury. Yeah. And so these kinds of sort of um, uh, experiences for me were kind of telling me something about the way that racial humor creates in-group, sort of out-group, the way it's used in the service of power, um, and, and, and essentially how it's in everyday discourse that is happening at the micro scale. I'm seeing this happen in my sort of dorm room and you know, in my own lived experience in everyday life. And now there's a sort of a sort of global example of how this is happening, again, creating in-group, out-group, how it's being used in, in sort of in, in, in a way to reinforce power. Can I can uh, I can I get you just to stop for a second and explain to us that in-group, out-group dynamic? There's a lot of uh, our listeners are sociologists, but they might not be micro sociologists or okay. might not be so. What is happening in your view? Can you explain to us what's happening on a sociological level when people are telling these types of racist jokes? Like what's going on? What's the function? What like peel back the layers for us? Sure. So, so I think part of what's happening, especially when, when, when it's the, in the context of humor, is we also have to understand that humor is a social emotion. Like, like you're inviting people to play. You're inviting people to have and enjoy a pleasurable experience. Um, and when you're doing that, part of what you're doing is you're creating a social sort of bond, a social a context for social cohesion, for social alignment. And humor is a pretty effective way to do that because, you know, the, the purpose is to create laughter. And of course, if we look at the way that, uh, you know, sort of neuroscience, I mean, a lot of people have been theorizing the, the sort of the the pleasurable role of humor and sort of making people feel good. I mean, now we have the science to kind of back it up. When you're laughing, I mean, you can measure people's hormones and neuropeptides and all kinds of stuff. And, and your body is, is actually pumping feel good chemicals to do that. And so if we're thinking about in group and out group, when you're sharing a joke with, with other people and you're laughing and you all are kind of, you know, engaging in social bonding, I mean, you're really creating a social bond in a way that the people in on the joke are kind of making, uh, uh, are being made to feel good with each other. You're creating a context of social and group pleasure. So that creates an in-group, like you, you feel tighter. I mean, think about your experiences with your friends and family and what are the good times? The good times often involve, involve sort of joking and humor and laughter and you're, you're feeling good. So that creates an in-group. But when the joking and laughter is, at the expense of another group. Now you have a third party, right? So these two are sort of sharing an experience. You create in-group, but if it's at the expense of a third party, now you're creating further distance from that third party. So instead of doing what the humor is doing here, which is you and you know, the joke teller and receiver laughing, coming together, becoming friends and so forth, when it's at the expense of, a, of, of, a, of the other, you're creating greater distance from that other. So now you're creating sort of boundary, you're creating alienation, mm -hmm. you're saying they're not part of the group. And so at the micro scale, that's what's happening. And now we can sort of zoom out our sociological lens and say, well, how is this happening in a sort of, you know, in an organization? I mean, Victor talks about organizations quite a bit. Um, how is this happening in a society? How is this happening within a country, a nation state? And of course, you know, uh, sociologists and others who've been studying humor they've studied humor to an extent in this way thinking about you know the national humor of a society and, and how national identities can be sort of reinforced by the jokes we tell about other nations right so when we make fun of the french when we make fun of whatever so you're, you're creating a sort of sense of group identity so like just to make sure i understand so it's almost as if you're saying you know there are some aspects of exclusionary behavior or scapegoating that like can make people feel good and bound to one another. It's almost like there can be psychic rewards to hateful or exclusionary behavior. And you're saying like when people avail themselves of racist humor, that's effectively what they're doing. They're like enjoying a rush, enjoying a moment at someone else's harm, like uh, at the expense of someone else's well-being. Absolutely, and that's one of the points that I'm trying to stress in the book um, in terms of thinking about what what is, how do emotions, right? What Eduardo Benito Silva called in his um, 
uh, ASA presidential speech, I think it was 2018, uh, racialized emotions. Mm -hmm. So how do racialized emotions contribute to social and racial inequality and, and systemic and structural racism? So emotions can do that. Um, but if we look at the way that our, you know, scholarly discourse, sociologists tend to do this too, thinking about emotions, what role do emotions play in creating racial inequality and racism? Well, the emotion we tend to focus on most consistently is hate or anger or these kinds of sort of emotions that you can readily see. It's like, ah, you know, if you do a Google search, you know, racism, you're going to find images. Images. If you do a Google search image, you're going to find images of a screaming white supremacist, you know, tiki torches at a sort of you know, Charlottesville. So, so we imagine that racism is primarily motivated through like hatred and, and anger in these kinds of ways. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate in the book is like, no, wait a minute, uh, racism is fun too. Uh, and in fact, if we look historically at American society, one of the most consistent ways that racism has played out um, uh, in, in in everyday life from the micro scale to organizations and at the national and international arena has been through racist fun and humor, the pleasure of seeing the other as inferior, right? Mm. And, so, and so here that I'm drawing on humor theory and on social psychology and emotions, and I'm also drawing on Du Bois's work. I mean, this is where the title of the books come from, The Souls of White Jokes. I'm really drawing on Du Bois's his work on the souls of black folk, but also on his work on the souls of white folk, where he's kind of hinting at what, what is the affective power of sort of creating in-group and, and out-group. Um, and, you know, in his, in his sort of famous sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of observation in the souls of, of uh, black folk, right? Du Bois talks about, you know, the double consciousness, and he talks about it being this peculiar sense of looking at oneself through the eyes of others while measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on an amused contempt and pity. And so in my book, I kind of tease that out from Du Bois and I say, amused contempt, this is a very powerful metaphor, especially for me because I've been studying humor for over a decade. And you know, humor scholars uh, have developed this sort of insight or this, this kind of theory that goes back to like Plato and Aristotle of you know, one of the functions of humor being a form of reinforcing a sort of uh, sense of superiority, right? Mm. Uh, the, the schadenfreude, which you mentioned earlier. I mean, that's kind of the German term for finding joy in the misery of others, right? right. Um, and so when it comes to racism um, and, and linking that to the pleasure of, you know, seeing the other as inferior, I mean, this is a consistent feature of, especially in, in, in our case here of American society, going back to the era of blackface minstrelsy, um, and through the present, how amused contempt, um, or what I call in the book, amused racial contempt, this pleasure, this joy of ridiculing the other to sort of create a sense of sort of group identity, but also group position, right? You are on the bottom, we are on top, we ridicule you, and we sort of mock and sort of find pleasure in the, in the things we see you sort of lacking, right? Um, and this is one of the ways that, again, you create in-group, out-group, when it comes to race, the power of racist humor has been to sort of reinforce sort of uh, notions and structures of white supremacy, right? White supremacy premised on the idea that well, whites are superior. Well, humor is a really effective way to communicate that in the everyday. Right. These groups are inferior because of this. Oh, let me tell you a joke, or let me look at the, the buffoon on the stage. You're sort of othering in a way that is pleasurable so that it's normalized and then that normalization is then it's taken as sort of confirmation of proving the inferiority of this group. So uh, first of all, before we move, I just want to uh, remind our viewers who are online. Uh, welcome, we got Hani, uh, uh, Anthony, and Megan. Uh, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and ask them. I have a question just for Anne and Victor, just talking about this emotional side of racism and racist behavior racist tropes and, and and I guess that's part of what makes it so difficult to purge from the culture. Can you comment on any of this sort of like the emotional reward uh, of, of, of racism or, you know, sort of eth ethno-nationalism or ethnocentrism? Yeah, I if I can speak to that, I, I really wanted to touch on that because this is an area in which Raoul's work really helped me understand better my own. So I also, I really want to thank Raoul. And I can say, um, 
I can say a lot of fantastic things about that about this book, but maybe I'll, I'll start off on this more um, personal aspect of, of what it helped me understand. So uh, let me just, just quickly give you a backstory on something I've been working on. So as, as Joe mentioned, I just published a book, which is a comparative look at how people think about race in Italy and the United States. And in um, that work, what I found was that despite Italians and other Europeans' belief that somehow race doesn't really exist across the Atlantic and they, they're like free of that and only we Americans have race issues and they don't have any, that uh, my co-author Marcello Mareri and I found a lot of commonalities. And, and probably the most striking commonality that we found between Americans and Italians was ways in which they talked about sports. And of course, the ways in which they talked about sports were often infused with jokes. And what I mean more specifically was um, we found out that as much as both Americans and Italians would say things like, well, they didn't really believe in race, they know race doesn't really exist, you flip the switch and you get them talking about sports, get them talking about track and field, get Americans talking about the NFL, and you ask them, why do you think African descent people are overrepresented in certain sports, let's say in American football? or let's say European descent athletes, whites are overrepresented in sports like hockey or, or swimming. And you get very, very strong racial notions on that. And the, the main thing that came out again and again was this claim that black people, and particularly they're thinking about black men, have these kind of superhuman athletic abilities. But the ways in which our interviews would often present this to us was in the form of jokes. Because they had sort of previously been telling us that they didn't really believe in race or race was constructed and there was no such thing as race. But when it came to the topic of sports, they couldn't help themselves in a sense. They couldn't help themselves and they, they kind of had to go to this more, these more biological realm. And I think the way that they finessed that incongruity was by saying these are jokes. And so I, you know, I was thinking a lot about you know, why in such different countries? I mean, in Italy, like the black population is small. Why would people be so invested in all these jokes about black bodies? And just, you know, just to be clear, people would say things like, oh, you know, in my family, we have this joke that blacks are so good, you know, they're such good runners because they had to run away from lions, you know, uh, back in the savannah, or their um, ancestors had to chase down tigers to wrestle them to the ground to eat them for dinner, all, you know, and they, you know, they would sort of be laughing about this. And I, so I really wondered, first of all, why those kinds of stories would be as predominant in a society with few Black people as one with a much larger uh, Black population. And I was sort of going through all these ideas like, well, okay, surely, you know, for sure these are white supremacist ideas. They reassure white people, Europeans including, that they are kind of at the top of the food scale intellectually and all that. You know, I think there's also a, a gender and sexuality angle because this is often white men talking to me about black bodies and kind of fantasizing these black bodies to be superior. And that certainly comes out a lot in the sort of white supremacist he, um, humor that, that Aurel talks about. But what, but what Raul's book really helped me understand better was why these jokes also had such a warm affect to it. That is, people who in one part of the interview would tell me, oh, I don't believe in race, they would be very happily and funnily and, and warmly recalling these jokes with their families and their friends and their team coaches and, and this and that. So that whole emotional register of warmth, uh, joy, happiness, um, also they were very relaxed in telling these stories as opposed to other ways in which they might talk about race. Rel's book really helped me understand how for them, jokes about Black people were happy objects, as he put it. They were happy-making objects. And I think the fact, too, that, you know, as he tells us, so much of this humor now has been relegated to the private sphere, certainly in the U.S., and even to some extent in Europe. People have the sense that there are certain things you shouldn't say in public, but as Raul makes clear, people feel pretty comfortable. A lot of white people feel comfortable saying these things in private, um, and not only white, white people, and we'll, we'll probably talk about that later. But um, but I think also, you know, the fact that now people are swapping these stories, these jokes in the intimate sphere, and often with a feeling that it's a forbidden pleasure, as Raul also notes, it kind of adds to this whole emotional register of people taking delight in this degradation of people of color. And on that note, I also just want to mention really briefly, I, I think that 
uh, Rao's book is in is in line with um, the work of a political scientist named Cristina Beltran, who's my colleague here at NYU, who wrote a book called Cruelty as Citizenship. It's a really slim volume. I really recommend it. It's really interesting in which she argues that you know violence and racial violence in the United States is not only uh, you know, ba you know, baked into our DNA, uh, an important part of our history, but that we've got to wrap our minds around the fact that this violence was experienced by its perpetrators with joy, was experienced, and by the whites who consume news of it as good news, as assuring news. Um, mm. And so, and and I think Raul is right also to you know when he draws the link between humor and violence that the racist humor that we're seeing is in a sense kind of a symbolic form of the racist violence that we, we see, you know, incarnated in very tragic ways on a daily basis. And I get the sense from what you're saying that it's almost like there's the content of the message and then there's like an emotional overlay where you can like, you can say something racist with a happy face or an angry face or whatever, and people are strategic about the emotion that they overlay on the message. So if you want to say something that you feel would be offended if it were taken serious, then the it's like a, a strategy to just overlay it with the veneer of a joke. And then you can say that thing and feel like you, you know, you have a permission structure. Is that sort of what you're both getting at? I, I think absolutely that people felt that they could say things, you know, when they associated them with, with jokes that they wouldn't say when, for example, in parts of our interview, when we ask them in a more serious way, you know, tell us how you would define the word race. They take on a serious yeah. cast. There's a serious attitude. But again, when we get to the sports, it's all jokey and people feel unburdened and, and happy to say things. I also want to say one other thing about the jokes that I think comes across in, um, in Rel's work that, and, and certainly I saw strongly in mine, is that weirdly enough, when people tell these old, like, red worn jokes that we we can all imagine you know it have been told a million times people often experience them as new and as witty so people think they're being very witty like people would tell me <laughs> yeah. all the time you know like it was just in their family that there was this joke about africans and lions and i was thinking no no really this this is not just your family like you you guys are basically just the mouthpieces of a whole collective imaginary about race and yet people like to think it's just them coming up wittily with these things about watermelons and fried chicken yeah. So so I think the humor is also doing something there as well, right? It's sort of making our ideas seem like individual ideas. And I think, you know, just to touch on one more thing that I think is that I found a huge contribution from Rel's work is that he's really pushing the field of humor studies to understand humor, not just a matter of as a matter of sort of individual motives, why the individual might engage in here in humor, but to understand humor as a social tool, like a, a social force. Um, so yeah, just one of many contributions of this book. Victor, what, what's your take on the use of racist humor? Uh, and, and, you know, what, what, what's, what's, what, what do you see at work when you look at the topics? So, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot. I'm gonna follow up. I felt like Anne was like, like had a sort of perfect setup for me um, with, with it, with the, talk of, of a colleague's book on cruelty, because as I read this, um, I couldn't help but think of uh, Adam Serwer, who's a writer for The Atlantic, who uh, wrote this phrase that became sort of like, the, I think one of the defining phrases of the Trump era, and that was the cruelty is the point. And so like, to make this, this argument, he uh, opens the, the essay that's titled The Cruelty is the Point, with a description of a lynching photo in which, you know, lynchings were horrific mass murders, but they were also bonding experiences and rituals for white Americans. And he says that, you know, there's this, this horrific photo of a lynching and in the foreground of the photo, there's these white men with like huge smiles on their faces. And what, and Sirwer, you know, analogizes that to what he was watching at Trump, um, rallies, right? And the sort of joy and bonding with which Trump would make racist and sexist and ableist jokes. And the crowd would like visibly bond 
over this sort of shared cruelty of not just saying like who we're against, but this person is going to ridicule them and, and make it clear that they are against, right? And so as I was reading Raul's book, sort of this, that essay was, was in my mind also as like a, a sort of thinking about how timely Raul's book, sort of a broader explication of this, this humor. The other thing that I thought was just like, really well done and somewhat hard to do is I thought part of the argument for the book was embedded in the structure of the book. And so like as a writer, this is the kind of thing that you you want to do. And, and what I mean is Raul moves from an analysis of sort of blatant white supremacists openly saying, we are using racist humor to sort of break down people's natural aversion to cruelty and treating people horribly. And we're using this humor to recruit. And there's a built-in plausible deniability. So we can say, we're just joking. And it actually inverts sort of, it makes the out group look as if they're, you know, squares <laughs> because they're not willing to accept their denigration. And so then, so he starts with sort of groups that they claim they're racist. So no one is going to say, are, are you inferring their beliefs, right? Or are you, are you overreacting? These folks are like, we want white supremacy, right? And then he moves to police departments and it's the same jokes, right? <laughs> Without the awareness of the sort of plots. And then he moves to the political arena and it's the same jokes. And again, to, to refer to what Anne said, like this stuff is boring, right? Like it is, it is just like the, the so simple-minded, so basic, right? No creativity, but you know, it's from a shared well of, racist affect. Um, and I think like showing the continuity so well as Raul does shows that like, although the folks in the police departments and in the political arena would say that they're not intending to sort of break down people's resistance to this, mm -hmm. um, they're using intentionally or not the same strategies as over white supremacists, right? And I think it's, it's really powerful. The last thing I'll say is um, I also thought, you know, I, I, I write about colorblind racism. I think colorblind racism was a very important sort of theoretical moment describing how like it's the reason I went to grad school for sociology. Well, right? What is color? What's colorblind racism? So, colorblind racism. So there's this narrative in the race literature and Benia Silva is probably the sort of biggest proponent of it that, um, you know, in the sort of post-civil rights era, there was a, a stigma against open expressions of racism, right? So folks stop using the N-word in public, right? Um, and I think what Rahul shows is that like humor, because of the sort of like built-in deniability and the edginess and taboo allowed sort of a, a an escape hatch from colorblindness, <laughs> which ways people could express these ideas. Um, and it helped sort of undermine the colorblind consensus. And I think we've seen the mainstreaming of some of these ideas through humor, right? And so I don't think that like your argument is, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I don't think your argument is that like colorblind, the sort of bigger colorblind narrative of changes in the post-civil rights era was incorrect. I think you say like, here's a big caveat to that, right? And if we're if we're not paying attention to this caveat, it can bring back sort of the more overt stuff. Uh, no, I, I think that's exactly uh, right, Victor. And, and first, uh, Anne and Victor, like, I'm really grateful you all read the book. I, I'm glad you, you found it interesting or insightful or, or whatever it's supposed to do. Um, but I really, I really appreciate your takes. Uh, thank you so much for, for, you know, your time and energy and reading it. Um, and so I have a few comments for for for, uh, for on both of your takes. But first, Victor, yeah, that's absolutely right. It's uh, I mean, this is what I consistently saw in sort of my moment of going to graduate school, studying this work, sitting in undergraduate and graduate seminars. And here are the books. Here are the theories. Here's where the field is. And so in a moment where we sort of we we were sort of understanding this consensus uh, in, in with the election of a Barack Obama that, you know, uh, you know, colorblindness has arrived. We're in a post-racial society. 
um, all this stuff that we kind of understood about the pre-civil rights era and how racism operated, well, that's kind of, we're moving away from that. And so a number of sort of pretty uh, influential and significant um, you know, books and, and, and articles by sociologists were, were really discussing this kind of declining trend and declining acceptability of racist discourse. Right, folks like Lawrence Bobo and Joe Fagan, Eduardo Benito Silva. I mean, a number of other folks too. They were saying, "Look, it, um, we're in a new era where there is a stigma to be racist. Even the Klan members, like you know David Duke, are saying they're not racist. So <laughs> it is a taboo now. Like you're not supposed to be open about it. And for me, it's like, okay, the literature is telling me this, but my lived experience and what I'm witnessing here day in, day out in the dorm room and what I'm seeing at the geopolitical arena, I'm like, wait a minute, there's something else going on here that sociologists are not paying close attention to. Like sociologists are sort of making this, this other argument that I find interesting, that I find compelling, but I find it incomplete. Um, and so for me, it was like, you know, again, I non-traditional student sort of here. So what do I know? Right. I'm like, you know, I didn't even get, get SAT scores to get into these universities and my grad, you know, uh, what is it? The, the, the graduate entrance exam was, was pretty shitty too. So I was like, what do I know? I'm just like a nobody, but I'm like, there's something here. Like there's something here that, that, that I don't find the sociology sort of literature convincing. Like it's not fully convincing. Like there's something here that's not convincing me. And, you know, as an undergrad and as a grad student, I kept sort of scouring through the sociology journals. And I'm like, there's a missing piece to this puzzle that sociologists are not putting together. And when, when what they're telling me is like not quite fitting. And so for me, it's like, you know, I was like, okay, well, how do I make sense of it? I was, this was still a nagging question for me. And it was sitting in my, um, I think it was in my undergraduate um, research methods course where I was starting to think about this. And my, um, my uh, professor at the time, Sam Gilmore, uh, he says, hey, Raul, this is a pretty interesting topic, you know? And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I keep going to the library and I don't find a whole lot of literature here. So I'm having a hard time like really come, make, making sort of uh, 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 coming up with an answer for this that I'm satisfied with. And he's like, well, you know what? That's a pretty great problem to have. And I'm like, why is that? He's like, well, because maybe you're the person to go out and find that answer. So I think I took myself too seriously. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to the library and I'm going to figure this shit out. And, but it's been incredibly hard because then I had to like, okay, sociology doesn't have the answer I'm looking for. Well, let me look into humor studies. And that's a whole sort of field that, I mean, we don't really get trained on. I'm just like kind of trying to figure this shit out. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, the humor studies are saying this, the, uh, and then now let me go into sort of the neuroscience because now neuroscientists are interested in sort of humor and cognition and the folks on emotions. And, you know, now what are sort of the, uh, sort of, uh, critical race callers saying? So it's like, I had to sort of cobble and piece me a lot of this stuff. So it took me a long time, like a pretty long time to kind of wrap my head around what I think I was trying to say. Um, and the book, I mean, it was, it was an attempt to do that. I don't know if I'm fully sort of there quite yet, but I feel like it's moving in the direction of saying, hey, we need to take this in, like seriously. Like we need to understand that this is happening because there has been a change in the culture where the what would otherwise be used um, as a serious comment about sort of how to think about race has moved from the terrain of seriousness into the terrain of the unseriousness but still doing that work and perhaps doing it even more effectively because the larger social culture is that this serious take on sort of uh, on the issue of race is no longer acceptable. So to Anne's point, right, and uh, this is really fascinating to me, uh, and I'm also really interested in kind of, you know, sort of culture and politics in, in, in Italy. I, stu I studied abroad in Italy when I was in undergrad and I was there. Um, uh, no way, where were you? Where in Italy were you? Uh, in Rome, I studied abroad in, in Rome, and nice. then um, I, I went back this past summer, I think, and I gave a talk there at a university. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out that connection back there too. So maybe you're the person to talk to. Right. Let's talk. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but as point, right, that the way that uh, race and sports discourse becomes a way to sort of, you know, make these observations, um, these kind of confirmation biases uh, today, in this jokey way. I mean, this reminded me of, you know, Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics, 
where, you know, Jesse Owens destroys the Nazi team and, you know, he wins, you know, the gold medals. And all of a sudden he sort of disproves Hitler's sort of point that they're the master Aryan race. They're superior to everybody. Of course, they're going to dominate the Olympics. And Owens sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, wipes them all out. And, uh, and so the, there was now a sort of moment of we need an explanation for this. How is it possible that this black guy beat, you know, all the sort of German runners, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the race? And the confirmation bias that was being shared, not in a jokey way, but in a serious way, you know, by his own coach and by, you know, other sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, athletic sort of, you know, commentators and observers were like, well, the reason Owens is so fast is because, you know, his race was only sort of running in the jungles to escape the cheetahs and the yeah. lion tigers, you know, of very recently. So there's this kind of innate brute physical sort of, you know, strength that the African has because they were living in the jungles just, you know, very, you know, you know uh, shortly ago. And, and at that point, I mean, the coaches and stuff, like they're saying that not in a joke, they're not trying to be funny. They're, they're saying, no, that there's something to this. It's like an, a, a, an analytical exercise that they're engaging in. Is that what they're going for with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it makes sense yeah. why that was the case in the early 20th century, because you know, the, the, the science at that time was sort of structured in a way to prove that, right? I mean, going back to, uh, in American society, going back to Thomas Jefferson, I mean, Jefferson was the one who called on science to prove whether or not Blacks were innately inferior biologically um, to, to whites. Um, and then over and, the- And also European colonialism was still going on. It was still in its heyday. I mean, you know, Italy had colonies in Africa then, so that also was a, a backdrop that- that gave sense to this analysis, analytical exercise, as Joe put it. Absolutely right, but but the, like the the uh, in terms of the intellectual legitimacy of that was the fact that the, that the science itself was structured in a way to say, you know, we have theories of mankind, and the dominant theory says that the races are real, and there's a pecking order to the races, right? Um, and of course, over time, that idea of what the sciences are trying to legitimize through their theories and evidence and whatever um, is, you know, most people are not reading theories of mankind, the book that's like this thick, right? Um, but the comic way in which the same punchline can be received, which is that race is real and some are inferior, some are superior, is something that the popular culture does at that time, which is blackface minstrelsy, which was the most popular form of entertainment uh, up until the civil rights period. Um, and it becomes a global sort of form of entertainment, not just in, in the United States. Um, but it's during and after the civil rights movement that this gets contested for the first time in US and in Western history, that, wait a minute, racism is a problem, racism is bad, this, even the scientists are now kind of changing their tune and saying, wait a minute, maybe we got it wrong. We got to sort of reevaluate this stuff. Now they're looking at the DNA structure and saying, wait a minute, there's nothing in here that says race is real. So now there's a, the society is kind of having a crisis. Like they're trying to figure out what do we do about race? And it's like, in that moment, it's like, well, for one, um, maybe we should stop saying racist things. Maybe like that should start to happen, right? On the heels of this movement. And this is why I say that racist humor then becomes kind of the ideal candidate in this so-called colorblind or post-racial moment, because you could still say the thing that was being said seriously, right? So the you know, yeah. Jesse Owens culture, whatever that, you know, they're, they're closer to the primitive, that was being said in sort of in all seriousness. Now you can't say that post-civil rights, but you can kind of joke about it, right? Especially with people you think will appreciate the joke or find it funny. And you're saying the same thing, but now you're saying it in a way that it's tongue in cheek. Hey, hey, you know, what do you think about this? But it's still confirming the sort of yeah. the idea or belief that the races are real and some are superior and some are inferior because of this biological sort of, you know. Yeah. Uh, Raul, if I can just jump in a second, that really underscores something that came home to be reading your book that in a way, jokes, racist jokes are a vehicle for the essentialism that the sciences once used to champion. So like you said, you know, science, you know, going back to the 18th century, supposedly had this, you know, objective scientific, you know, 
accurate take on race and you know a hierarchy of, of races, as you put it. Um, and basically, the kinds of jokes that you write about are, are doing exactly the same function. They're essentialist. And by that, I mean that they are conveying the idea to their listeners that a that there are such things as races in the world, that they're clearly identified races, black, white, whatever they might be, Jewish and you know, white supremacy and, and so forth and so on. And not only that, that these races have permanent, inbred, intrinsic characteristics that will never change. So that when we're joking about them and making fun of them, it, it's not because of their kind of passing foibles, it's because they can't help themselves. They're just naturally you know, inferior in these ways and nothing can be done about that. So that the jokes end up getting across exactly the same message that the old race science used to get across. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I add just because there is there is something that uh, resonates. Sometimes it isn't even imparted as an ill will. Like I'm thinking about all of the uh, controversies surrounding uh, Dave Chappelle's jokes and a write up in the New York Times. OK, so the idea that Jews can rewrite history and control information, that's factually false and it's, it's damaging to us. And there's different ways that you can tell it. You can tell it by being mad. Uh, you know, in like the Kyrie Irving or Kanye way, you can tell it like a joke, but there's also like a version that is complimentary that praises us for our money making acumen and our ability to control things, even though we're, and it's meant in earnest, almost as if it were a compliment. And sometimes you get this from people who are trying to ingratiate themselves with you. Every and so like, but I'm getting from Raul's thing. It's like the interesting part is the separation between the emotional overlay and the underlying factual assertions. Like if you're purveying something false, a false generalization, it can be funny, it can be articulated with love or with anger, but the, the falsehood itself is damaging. Am I, because I'm not a race guy, am I sort of sniffing around for sort of the main idea here? Am I in the ballpark at least? I mean, I, I think so, right? I mean, there's this kind of old, old cliche when it comes to humor that you know, it's funny because it's true, mm -hmm. right? So that this idea that you know the joke might be ex an exaggeration of something, the joke might be sort of, you know, you create an absurd sort of scenario or setup or whatever in the story to get to the punchline, but that the punchline and part of why the punchline sort of hits or, or is kind of well received and creates humor is because there's something in there that people sort of you know might believe is true even if it might be false, right? Um, and so it, when it when it when it comes to sort of this taboo nature of humor on certain topics, you know, you know, Freud, you know, talked about sort of humor in the way that it can give pleasure to certain sort of forms of discourse when the broader civil society says, this is not something we should talk about, right? So he talks about these sort of jokes and their relations to the unconscious, which is, I think is a very fascinating book um, to, to read theoretically about the power of humor when it comes to social psychology, I mean, there's some kind of weird stuff in there, of course, Freud's kind of analysis of how he's trying to get to, to what's actually happening, but it, but it's very powerful. And for me, it's, it's pretty convincing argument that you know when the, when the society says, this is something we ought not to really talk about openly, those kinds of topics tend to become ideal topics for a sort of shared pleasure because you can joke about them and now you create your in-group in contrast to the other sort of you know, normative sort of civil discourse or whatever and say, well, this is what other people think or what people say officially we should think about this, but we over here privately, like we, th we, we, we have a different take on it. We have a different uh, perspective on it. So that can happen with all kinds of discourse. I and mean, you can imagine, you know, the way faculty, you know, kind of have their in-jokes about administration and, you know, vice versa, right? So the, the different sort of scales of this can happen. Uh, but as Anne points out, like, so even in Italy, right, where it's a different context, not the same history as the United States, but still there's a global discourse about race that is here Italians can sort of joke about in the everyday in a way that is still confirming this kind of, this notion that again, used to be expressed as a scientific reality, gets contested, but it's still today, there's like a kernel of truth that people sort of cling to because it's like, well, it's funny because it's true, maybe not in the same way, but you know what, you know what I mean, like, right? And so there's ways to kind of, to downplay it, especially when it's a joke. And to Victor's point, I mean, this is precisely the reason that, you know, overt white supremacists are weaponizing humor, not just overt white supremacists, I mean, others, but, but they're consciously doing this because they're realizing, you know, maybe they're reading, 
you know, my book or something. No, I'm just saying. Uh, they're, they're consciously understanding that humor and affect and emo it does something. It brings people together. The naughty humor sort of, you know, means, you know, you, you can share a laugh with somebody. And if you can share a laugh with somebody, maybe you share other things. Maybe you share a worldview. Um, and I think Victor has a... I, yeah, I, I wanted to add something to this. Um, and that is, you know, there's this, this part in your book in which... It, again, correct me if I'm wrong, I finished the book last week, but there's this part in which your book in which you talk about how quickly this humor can turn to threat. And so that is, I think, you know, there's this sort of like underlying edge, right? And you're describing something like, I, I think it was someone was being harassed at work, a black man was being harassed at work, he reported this, and then the next thing you know, there was like a noose in his locker, right? And so there's this immediate change, right? And so like, what that shows is that like, he was right, right? Like he was interpreting the humor correctly. He knew that this humor was not it was laughing at, not with, right? Yeah. Like it was not bridging. It was, it was distancing, right? And so I think, you know, I think about this, if we think about, you know, your example of Chappelle, or we think about sort of debates over, I, I hate this word and I never use it except with derision. If we hate like woke, sort of mm -hmm. woke culture, right? Like the folks saying this is demeaning are right. In the same way that the folks who were protesting minstrelsy in the 1920s were correct. They understood the social function of the humor and those at the top denying that social function are again, using the very plausible deniability to their, to their advantage, right? Is that, so Victor, you're saying it like sits in the subtext. It's a way for us to communicate taboo views with each other but just leave it in the subtext so that we have some type of plausible deniability. I think so. And I think, you know, you see this all the time on, I think the very response, can't you take a joke, sort of gives up the game, right? Because if it was really about like bonding or friendship, then someone saying like, you know, if one of my friends tells me I've done something that is offensive or upsets them, my response is, how do I fix that? Right? Like, like my response is like, how do we bridge this over because I value the friendship. My response is not, well, that's on you. Yeah. <laughs> or you don't understand what I meant here, right? I might try and clarify, but ultimately in, you know, in the benefit of like, Saving, uh, creating the, a stronger relationship, right? And so I think when you see that, right? If when you see this in, in the public and someone's like, oh, they're overreacting. Oh, they're being too sensitive. Probably not, right? Well, you, it's and also it, like, they can't explain the joke. That's part of the problem. Because usually yeah. if you tell a joke and somebody's offended, you can be like, well, I was trying to say yeah. uh, that these people are crazy or this is funny or that. But you can't be like, well, I'm just saying that this group causes crime or this group exploits yeah. people. Or, like they can't explain yeah, right. the joke because the subtext, if you make it out right, it's just patently false and offensive, right? Yeah, yeah. I had this woman, you know, I, I in my dissertation, I had this woman who was in the military and she, she talked about, uh, you know, being one of the few women in her unit. And she said, you know, at first she would like laugh at the racist and sexist jokes. And she said at a certain point, um, she started, to question herself and say, what are you really saying, right? Like she said that like it, it was so frequent and so over the top that at a certain point she realized like, this is not a joke, right? Like this is a very serious thing. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I'll leave it there. So we're coming up a very sadly, we're coming up past an hour and this gets into the time when my producers will get mad because they have to go through all of this. So very quickly, can you just each of us can you leave each of us just sort of with like a, a take on the intersection of like race humor and culture like what were the big things that you walked away thinking about from Raul's book and like uh, directions for the discipline that maybe Raul's book suggests just any type of take or reaction anybody want to sort of jump in uh, or I can if you want a second no you know I'll I'll take a, a stab at that. Um, that's a tall order, but I, I want to, um, I guess, touch on one thing. So two things, actually. So one of the things that I think is such a great contribution of this book is that 
it makes clear that this, this racist humor hasn't disappeared, or, or and as Rao puts it, that explicit bias hasn't disappeared, right? There's kind of been a temptation, sort of like, you know, thinking that we're in a post-racial era, there's been this temptation to think that we've kind of managed to like ban or erase from everybody's brains or vocabularies all kinds of overt, explicit, or del deliberate expressions of racism. And so that all we're left with now to kind of grapple with which would be a lot, but is, is only sort of these involuntary, you know, forms of implicit bias that we get because we're kind of steeped in a racist culture. But Rao's book really makes clear that, no, we still have a lot more um, to, uh, to combat that explicit forms of racism, of, of, I should say, verbal expression are flourishing. And I want to say that I think this is actually, this is especially important for us as sociologists, because interestingly enough, um, you know, the sociology of race is a, is a subfield of the discipline where scholars of, of color have made all kinds of, you know, great contributions uh, to the study of race. But interestingly, we often actually don't have such great access to, to this kind of space, right? We are not necessarily, you know, in the, the personal or family or intimate spaces where people are telling jokes about watermelons and fried chicken and stuff like that. So, and a lot of times we might have our hands tied behind our back a little bit in that we're not necessarily privy to it because people are sort of taking care to, to try to whitewash some of that in our presence. So I think that for a lot of reasons, um, what he's doing is really important to make that clear. And of course, it's also very important to make clear how much of this stuff is still circulating because there will also be just a lot of folks out there who just you know believe we've moved on and that's a thing of the past. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to, to say about uh, something that this book helped me understand was it also, as much as it is focusing on the ways in which whites are building a certain form of solidarity and using humor to do that, it made me think about two other things. It made me think about reactions from, from people of color. For one thing, it really, I think, it really made me understand, I think, in a deeper way, why the politics of respectability has been so important for communities of color in the United States, right? That if we look in, you know, the early 20th century sort of Du Boisian, or for example, you know, ideas of um, Booker T. Washington, but sort of all these sort of, you know, great uh, sort of Negro intellectuals, I'll, I'll use an outdated term, um, for whom the self-presentation of people of color was very important. And, and I realize now thinking about how much kind of racist humor and all these forms that, that Raul outlines in the history of our country, it makes me realize that the respectability that these communities of color sought wasn't just because they needed to prove that they were smart and capable and you know twice as good as anybody else. They did have to do that. But it wasn't just about competence that they had to demonstrate. It's also that they had to build a kind of shield against precisely this kind of constant denigration that amused content brought on. So that that was eye-opening um, for me. Um, and then, oh gosh, there was a second thing now, but I've already forgot it. So I better just pass, I'll, I better pass the baton on to, to Vic. I wanna, I wanna say really just one thing that I think is like super important for like grad students or, you know, even those of us who are no longer grad students. And that is like, paying really close attention to the classics. So, you know, he has this sort of, you know, Raul creates a whole theory from a line in Du Bois that I must have read 150 times and like never paused on, right? And that's the, the sort of amused contempt being central to the construction of what Du Bois was calling, you know, the, the I'll use the term to the Negro problem in the early 20th century. And, uh, I thought, wow, like Raul really mined, you know, a 120 year old article to, to and joined this sort of like broader Du Boisian turn in American sociology that folks like Auden Morris and uh, have, have championed. Um, he really joined it with, you know, lines I've read a bunch of times. And I thought that that was a really, a really interesting, and again, you know, to think about sort of like the craft of writing and the craft of thinking, a really interesting tack with the book. Nice. Raul, you get the you get the closer. I came back. I, I remembered oh. what I was going to say, though, if. Yes, totally. Go. All right. I'll say it really. I'll be quickly. And again, <laughs> it had to do this idea of what Raul's book made me think in terms of uh, people of color in the United States and their reactions to having to deal with this. So and I guess this is actually a, a sort of a question for Raul. Um, 
you in fact cite Du Bois as mentioning the comedy of racism. And it for me raised the question of how do people of use race, I'm sorry, use humor for anti-racist purposes. Um, and it's funny, just coincidentally, I just picked up at a book store the other day, this book by the comedian Amber Ruffin and her, her sister Lacey Lamar. Uh, this is the second of two books they've written. This one is called The World Record, the World Record Book of Racist Stories, published just this year. And, um, and it's, it basically like recounts all these just like crazy, crazy episodes of racism. And they, you know, as the blurb for the book says, it's both funny and shocking. It's, it dismantles racism, but it makes you laugh. And so anyway, so I guess I just wanted to mention that and ask Raul what, um, you know, what he thinks about the potential of humor for anti-racist purposes. Yeah, I mean, for, for a while I've been thinking about like, you know, I need to write maybe something or, or, or think more sort of clearly about the distinction between you know, racial, racist, and anti-racist humor. Um, and it, because there is a distinction, I think. And then, you know, it, it, I mean, this is a burgeoning field, I think, looking more closely and critically at, at race and humor. There is a distinction there. And, you know, one of the reasons that I, I went the route of saying, hey, racism really is being sort of uh, produced through humor is because over the last, you know, three decades or so, especially after the civil rights movement, there was a growing sort of almost like urgency uh, among sociologists and other scholars who were looking at humor to really emphasize the anti-racist potential of humor. So a number of books and articles that have been written about this um, over the last few decades that really were sort of trying to emphasize the subversive, the democratic potential for humor, somehow that, that humor is rooted in the liberal tradition of freedom of expression and that and that we need to salvage humor for what it really is versus what it sort of became by accident, you know, in the United States or when it's used by people in sort of in a way that it's not intended, right? So this idea that humor, first and foremost, is like, it's a social good. It's, it's, a, it's something that's good. And for me, as I've been thinking about this, it's like, well, wait a minute, we have to understand that humor is, is a sort of, is a human tool for communication the way that language is. So to say that language is inherently good and can only be good, I think is also sort of missing the point of what language does, is that it communicates, it conveys information. You're trying to get people to see your worldview. And that can be in, 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 on multiple angles, on both sides of the political aisles or agenda or worldview in the way that we, I think we can't sort of, I think there's a, there's kind of a, a sort of a, a, an, an embedded interest, I think, by especially academics that are committed to social justice and anti-racism and these things to say, no, no, but what it, we're, we're, at the end of the day, like what is the solution or how can we salvage this or what, we, what is the kind of hope, right? I mean, I just read Victor's uh, essay in the New Republic on, on sort of hope, right? And yes, we need to imagine and think about what are the possibilities, right? It's like, it's not just all negative and terrible. And absolutely, there's the anti-racist potential. But even within the, the humorists and comedians who historically have been invested in an anti-racist potential, uh, the British sociologist Simon Weaver wrote a book called The Rhetoric of Racist Humor. Um, and, uh, and in that book and, and some, of his others work, uh, some of his other work, he makes a compelling argument, which is that even anti-racist humor has the potential to reinforce racist notions when you're still relying on its frameworks like race, right? Um, and, and, and that that potential then gets sort of weakened because, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum, in this case, liberals or well-meaning sort of, you know, people of color who think that they're sort of consuming a sort of anti-racist take, how is the anti-racist human also sort of carrying that historical baggage of racial essentialism in the way that can still confirm this idea that the races are real? Not the same way, maybe the way that the sort of white supremacists are, which I document in the book, but in other work that I've done earlier, I did an ethnography of a comedy school, and these were mostly kind of well-meaning kind of liberal types here. And how were they reinforcing kind of an essentialist view of race? in trying to get to the punchline, in trying to get to the funny in, in the bit, uh, 
because they're relying on racial stereotypes. So on the one hand, trying to sort of unpack the stereotype, but then still kind of confirming it. And so it's a very tricky thing. And, and I, I feel like the work is, is much harder for the, for the, for the anti-racist side of the sort of agenda here to say, let's make the humor anti-racist. You know, the comedian Harry Kondobalu talks about this in some of his interviews in his earlier work, where he says, you know, writing, writing jokes and humor that I want to, that I want to sort of convey, and I don't want people to misread me as sort of, you know, what I'm trying to do with my humor. I want to make a, an anti-racist point. He says it's really hard to do that work because it requires so much effort because I have to think about who the punchline is, what's the punchline, who are the targets. I want to make sure that the target is the right target. I don't want people to misinterpret what it is. So the, so the mental calculation in the craft of writing anti-racist humor is so much more um, laborious than the racist joke because the racist joke in a racist system, in a racist structure, in a society of racist ideology, it's easier. It's easier to get to that. And, and as you really pointed out really well, Anne, even across, you know, on the other continent, across the Atlantic, people there will get to that punchline quicker, easier, because you know, there, you know, the, you know, I'm not even sure that the anti-racist humor is on the radar in, in that context, right? Um, yeah, I'm not, not sure either, yeah. 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 It's also it's easier to make those the racist jokes because they've already been made a thousand times. Like I don't really, I generally don't find them very novel. Uh, and, and and when you have your top political figures, whether it's Trump here, you know the right wing in Italy there, yeah. you know then, then it's a cakewalk. cakewalk to, oh shoot, I didn't even think about that angle. That there's a right wing party in Italy. Oh, power with a history of those kinds of jokes. Oh, you got okay. Now you bring us to SCOTUS, but <laughs> you. Oh, well, for, unfortunately, we, you know one of the problems is we didn't. We ran through like a, a third of what we could have been talking about. That's always the sign of a great panel. So one, I really hope you'll come back in to discuss this because I didn't think about the the whole Italy there, thing. I didn't there. think about the fascism. But we got to wrap it up there. So I'm going to wrap it up. You've been listening to the Annex, a sociology podcast. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more information, visit the Queen visit Queen's Podcast Lab.org. Uh, the Queen's Podcast Lab is